Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Thank you for uh, the Internet Society in Israel for, um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to tell a story, and the reason why I'm going to tell a story is in order to explain what I think is a tipping point, is we need to know, understand what's going on, what has been going on in the internet in the last 10 years. And I'm not talking about Israel, I'm talking about the internet as a global thing. <laughs> so the easy part of my story is what we've been seeing in the last you know, 10 years is really like the internet and networks, how they've been growing up to create a kind of an equalizing and empowering platform. And there are many examples, I'll give some, uh, but the idea in the base of that, those platforms are users that share, create, curate, organize, and, and do interesting things, which will explain what, with information. So let me give you some examples. For example, users creating viral information. Nobody thought about it before, right? And again, this is the part that is easy in my story. So, so we see the parody about Hitler that was, that was based on the Downfall movie or the I've got a crush on Obama that, that got 22 million views and became viral very fast or the 1984, the kind of mesh that Hillary got uh, from the vote different. Um, so all those are great examples of what the internet can really bring people to do. And, and there are am amazing examples. Another example is basically the Twitter when Osama bin Laden died and uh, the first tweeted, uh, tweeting was between two people and it took 13 minutes to the news basically to come and explain and start to report about the death of Obama and it took two hours for the White House to basically explain again and, and come with a formal about Osama bin Laden death. And, and the interesting thing is, is that all those two nodes basically became very viral because there were two interesting people involved. One is Brain Stettler, who was a New York Times journalist, but the other one was Keith Urban, who was the, the former um, Rumsfeld boy, he was called. So people believed him. So just another example. And we also see a lot of example of creating, sharing, and creating knowledge. One example is, is the Israeli startup, the ways that basically all the people are putting information to it in real time without us, without the user, it was nothing. Or the SSRN, this is for researchers where we create and an, uh, basically project of research together. Or putting metadata on, on different kinds of maps and Google. And there is, of course, the end user developers, which is the one part where basically users became developer through the years because they have now all the tools that allows them to start developing things. One example is the One Bus Away application, which is our students at University of Washington uh, basically developed that. And that, that is a very um, popular kind of application on Apple that basically you can download it and, and see what's happening with the traffic. Another example is the Oakland crime spotting, which is a visualization of what's happening in real time in Oakland in terms of crime. They basically have connected with the police stations and they're visualizing it to people so people can see what's happening and where. We can discuss obviously if it's good or not good from a community point of view, but we'll get to it. And finally, the, the WikiLeaks, the 250,000 cables or whatever cables that right now the number is that have leaked. And, and basically, we're using the fusion tables of Google in order to explain what was going on per and, and bring the information to people. All those and other kind of examples, contribution to political um, candidates, the, the spring, the Arab spring, and other things, all of these are great examples of basically what we've been seeing in the last 10 years of a kind of a burst of a lot of platforms that allows us to access information freely. Now I'm coming to the hard part of it. But all those stories are basically accompanied with another troubling kind of trend that we've been seeing in academia and in practica, that basically, if you look at it empirically, we see a very strong power law. And what do I mean by power law? I mean that, and you can look at it at a different occasion, I'll give different examples. Power law means that very few numbers of nodes, sites, users, developers, companies, basically holds the attentions of the many. Of, so, so most of the power sources are held by the few. Now, it's not because, I'm not talking about authoritarian regimes. Obviously, in authoritarian regimes like China and Iran, that would be obvious. I'm talking really about our decision 
to go with few services, with few applications, with few operation systems. Let's, let's look at a few examples. I've been following the search engine market for since 2002. What's interesting is not that the gatekeepers are changing all the time. So notice that, that Bing has started you know, somewhere there in 2009, and America Online uh, uh, also you know, vanished somewhere. It doesn't matter the names. The names will change. That doesn't matter. What's interesting is if you look at the four, four, four most kind of popular search engine, you'll see a very troubling kind of information. They've been capturing 98% of the attention of all of us. Now, what does that mean on, about us, about our ability to do things? We'll get to it when we'll talk about the tipping point. That's one example. Same thing we see in social network analysis. And again, I'm cheating a little bit because this is the global numbers. If you'll see per, per city and per country, you see much more concentrated numbers. Actually, you see in social networks numbers that are coming to like the first three social networks capture around like 80%, 85%, and even 90 in some of the countries in terms of attention. This is another visualization. If we're looking at operation systems, same thing, 90%. This is a very concentrated kind of, of information. What does that mean? If, if four operation systems basically are taking the attention, are being used by 90% of users, same thing if you're looking at the browser, much more, uh, by the way, condensed, 95.7% using all the browsers. We've been doing, uh, my group, I'm, I'm leading a, a group that, uh, that studies information virality, and my group was looking at the blogosphere. And what we found in the blogosphere, where it's, you know, blogosphere are people like you and me, that's right, so what can it be? It should be the most egalitarian place on earth. We found that the same thing happens there. There is a very strong power law, an extreme power law, actually, that happens. There are two very strong blogs that capture most of the information. The Huffington Post and the Daily Coast, this is an example of political information. In other things, it would be another two. And then there are another 20 kind of blogs that basically capture, again, the attention of most of them. And what does that mean? That all the dream about the tail exists. It, it's not something that does not exist. We, we are important. We bring the mass. However, in order to create the virality, you need the elite. You need the power kind of nodes in order to start the sparks of the virality. And that's a very troubling kind of message that is coming from, from the research. Finally, um, I'm, I'm hesitating saying about Wikipedia. Even Wikipedia, by the way, that is a great project that, that I admire. Even there, we have a lot of problems in terms of power law. We have, we have around 83,000 kinds of editors and 50, 15 million users. That means a half a percent of the people really write. Now, let's, say, let's talk about what it means. So, why, happens, what, why the power law happens? Well, first of all, it's us, it's human behavior. And it's attention, right? We can't concentrate it more than one thing, two things, three things, how many? Five things? So if I'm using a social network like Facebook, basically I would not like to use another two things more. Maybe Google Plus, maybe something else, but not more, right? I mean, there's a limited attention of what I'm, I'm, I'm capable of doing. Second thing, why the power law happens, and again, nobody's forcing us, it's really the human behavior, is you know the sense of following the herd. Everybody are using what? Am I not going to use it right now? I mean, I have to use it because everybody has an Android, everybody has an Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Why extreme power law? Because we have no problem. Now we have no physical limits, basically. And, and, and not only that we don't have any physical limits that stops us, so we can protest pot politically, for example. We can organize things that before we couldn't organize, but also we can organize in small herds according to what we like. For example, if I like singing in the bath, I can organize myself in a group with everybody that likes to sing in the bath. I don't know what will happen with this, but it's a it's a one way to you know, accumulate all the people in the world that sing in the bath. So let's talk about the tipping point. So we've been talking about two parallel basic trends. One is equalizing in wonderful platforms, and the second is a power law. What can we do? So for me, the tipping points, if there will be tipping point, the next tipping point, and it's a normative wishful thinking, is really to create those mechanisms that will be able to equalize this power law. 
And it's not an easy thing because how do you equalize Paolo while balancing all the overflow of information that we get? So it's a very delicate balance that we are playing all the time there when we are creating those new technologies. And the second uh, kind of, um, I would call it as something that we need to overcome, is how do we integrate the clouds? So it, you were talking about creating a cloud. I'm talking about integrating the cloud. If we'll integrate clouds, think about how, many inf how much information we can, we can basically, and what we can do with this information. However, integrating the clouds also has risk with it, right? If more integrating power. the, exactly, it's more power. So how do you create this balance between basically equalizing and, and kind of like balancing this power law on the other hand, maintaining a kind of a reasonable kind of an overflow in the internet. All this needs to happen in a triangular uh, relationship. So the next tipping point, the next technology needs to develop technology that is not for the technology's sake, but it is a, a technology that is basically developed with the, with the mind of value, value-sensitive design. So the idea that people behind are doing, are behaving, have values. We are building technologies to basically reflect certain values of people. We, and that's a little bit of different. We've been seeing some, some of those applications in the last years. We can't avoid that. I mean, it, people change the way that technology basically moves. If we build technology only for the technology's sake, then we can basically see very troubling kind of situation coming up from this. And I will finalize my, my words is by the last thing that I think is a tipping point, and you've been talking about measurement, Yasha, is really one of our problems is that we don't know how to measure. You know, we get all those measurements from morning and, and evening from all those kind of companies. But the truth is that we don't know how to measure really because there's so many, so many indicators, so many signals, all of them are misleading. And, and we are just learning, not only that, information item doesn't have boundaries. It flows between Facebook and Twitter and Google and everything. So when you measure, you measure vertically. You do not measuring horizontally. We are not able today to capture really what happens to information. So the next tipping point is really to be able to see the horizontal kind of pattern of what people are doing in the internet. Thank you very much. Thank you.